Hi, so I'm here tonight with Claire Late, who's very kindly agreed to have a chat um, to us about um, some aspects of her work and how they relate to physical activity. Um, so Claire, I wonder if you could start by just telling us a little bit about yourself. Okay, so um, I'm a MSK physiotherapist, so musculoskeletal physio by background. Um, I've been a physiotherapist for about 16 years now um, and took on a role back in 2009 time looking specifically at developing a service for cancer patients and have gone really from there in developing services within outpatients for people who have had cancer of, of all tumour groups um, from point of diagnosis right the way through to um, kind of active palliative patients and, and what has happened is I've developed a huge passion for the physical activity side of things um, within both my role as a physiotherapist on a one-to-one -one basis, but I've also developed exercise classes for people with cancer. So I currently work four days a week, week as a Macmillan specialist, where we are setting up physical activity programs and one-to-one -one service for breast, prostate and colorectal cancer. And then I work two days a week as a private physio, where I also do one-to-one -one clinics and run two exercise classes and advisory clinic. But a lot of it stems around physical activity, getting people back to mm -hmm. being physically active, but also um, around them being able to get back to their activities of daily living mm -hmm. and hobbies. And um, yeah, Brilliant. So that's kind of yeah. me in a nutshell. Really. Well, that sounds like a really, really interesting role. Um, I wonder, so for the participants of the course, um, we'll have covered um, cancer and, and other um, clinical conditions back in uh, the earlier weeks, but I wonder if you could just summarise a little bit about um, how you see the role of physical activity in, in both the prevention of cancer and in the management of, of cancer as well. Well, there's a lot of, I mean, I went on a, a course quite recently at the Royal Marsden where um, physical activity was seen as the fourth treatment um, alongside your surgery and your chemotherapy and your radiotherapy. And there's a lot of emerging evidence around the benefits from both preventing and managing um, within cancer of um, well, preventing cancer in the first place, but also once people have had cancer, actually preventing recurrence and increasing survival rates both from a cancer perspective, but also from the comorbidities that come as a result of treatments, particularly with regards to obesity and um, cardiovascular disease. So there's a lot of benefits um, for you know, from the point of preventing, but from the point of also managing once people have had cancer and then they have gone through a lot of their treatments, they're left with a lot of debilitating side effects, mm -hmm. both physically and emotionally as well um, and what physical activity has been shown to do is actually improve a lot of these debilitating effects um, so you know, from a pain perspective from depression anxiety um, but also from a weight perspective um, so there's a there's a lot of benefits um, around physical activity in in this patient group Mm -hmm. and it's really interesting that, that the medical um, establishment view physical activity as such a key intervention, isn't it, Along alongside chemotherapy and, and surgery. I, I didn't really realise that it was viewed um, as such a, a serious consideration. It, I think it is alongside... Um alongside those people that are researching it I think from one of the things that I've found is that in the general medical field it's often not um, and it often takes people like ourselves to actually say it's really important that you have that discussion with your patient um, there, there is a study that came out that said only nine percent of breast care nurses actually discuss physical activity with their patients which is quite a low number um, and again with oncologists it's around 21 percent and actually what we know is that if an oncologist recommends physical activity with a patient who've had cancer um, they increase increase their um, levels of physical activity by three metabolic equivalent tasks, which is, is crucial to the survival rates and risk of recurrence. So trying to promote that amongst the medical field and um, amongst our colleagues as physiotherapists is really really important um, so you know I think with regards to being seen up there highly it is amongst those that have done the research and, and are in the know with the physical activity but it needs more of us to actually get out there and say this is something that you know takes five minutes to have a conversation with a patient about actually this is really really important for your health and well-being um, both physically and emotionally and, and then that will hopefully then start to encourage more people to have those discussions Mm, absolutely, yeah. So, so it's been talked about at a kind of, well, at a, uh, a research level, but possibly not filtering down to, to clinical practice yeah, yet. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And I think there's an element of, of people are scared to have those conversations, mm. partly because they don't know, you know what they should be recommending. Um, 
uh, and because you know these people do have quite debilitating side effects, and it's often you know they come with their comorbidities as a result of their age or um, or as a result of treatments, and it's sometimes trying to manage that in the right way, and that's where I think as physios we have a very great place to play because we have that skill set to do that. And what's your personal experience of broaching the subject, which is something you must do very frequently with your patients? Do you, do you find that there's resistance? Are people open to, to hearing those messages from you? No, not at all. Um, I have, there are two groups of patients, as, we, as I think most, most of us will come across, those that have never exercised, they've never been in a gym, they don't like the idea of circuits. Um, and for those people, it's about actually having those discussions around, you don't have to go to a gym, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you can do outside of a gym setting um, that can be practical, they can do it at their home, they can go up downstairs. Um, with those that are perhaps the more complicated, I would see the more complicated are those that are, have been very, very active and find themselves very, very frustrated with the idea that that you know people talk about having a healthy lifestyle and being active and you don't get cancer if you've got that lifestyle and yet a lot of them do have cancer yeah, and then yeah. they struggle yeah. so there's a lot of complexities around having those discussions mm -hmm. of do you know what half the time you know these people it isn't a lifestyle cancer but it still helps you if we can get you back active mm -hmm. but sometimes it's about tailoring it it's about pulling them back a bit and saying perhaps don't do the level yet mm -hmm. that you were doing mm -hmm. um but once you're feeling a bit bit more confident your fatigue levels are better and um, then we, you know we can get you more active mm, mm, yeah so there's, there are lots of different i think lots of different conversations but majority of people once you say you know the, the fatigue was something i did touch on actually again 80 percent of cancer survivors struggle with fatigue and we know that exercise really helps with that so i think being able to say to people that those debilitating effects that they have exercise and physical activity can really help with actually gives them a sense of empowerment that they can do something about their life where mm. cancer's completely taking control. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it really brings home, what you're saying really brings home to me the importance of tailoring the message that you're giving to the individual. It's it's never a one size fits all approach, yeah. is it? And and uh, you know it seems that that that's very apparent working with people who've had cancer as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so so you've recently set up a bit of a, a network. Is that right? Um, to kind of link people in with physiotherapists around the country is that right? yeah yeah, yeah. Can, so can you tell um, us a little bit about that yeah of course so um basically you know one of the big things i think with the, with the role of physiotherapist in a lot of areas but particularly within cancer is it's really really poorly understood and, and what often happens is that we're very poorly resourced and then access to physiotherapists and to physical activity schemes becomes you know, quite limited. And what actually happened was um, a lovely breast consultant, Liz O'Riordan, who openly blogs on Twitter about her experiences with breast cancer. She was struggling and contacted me. Um, and she basically said that you know trying to get hold of a physiotherapist within her area was very, very difficult. And what we decided together was to try and form a database of physiotherapists across the UK um, to try and increase accessibility to those physiotherapists. Therapist. And then beyond that, look at the physical activity side of things and how we can, can incorporate that. And what I found was I had quite a few exercise specialists who also contacted me saying, well, actually, can we come on the list as well? Mm -hmm. So what I did was map that to um, my website. So now if a patient is within that area, what they can then do is look on the map at where a local specialist is um, and therefore get the treatment that they need or you know, access to exercise specialist or physiotherapist that can help. And I'd love to expand that more and, um, and you know, try and get more accessibility to those exercise specialists as well as the physiotherapist mm -hmm. and I guess to other tumour groups as well because it's been very focused around the breast cancer. Mm -hmm. But actually it's really important that all cancers have access to, or all people that have had cancer have access to those therapists as well. So yeah, it's been it's been a big, um, yeah, a big kind of learning learning curve really. And I think one of the other things that's come out of it is I'm very passionate about as a specialist trying to upskill people and give them the confidence that they can themselves. You know, we've all got our physiotherapy skills. But sometimes it's about having that confidence of using those basic skills that we have with a different client group or having somebody that can mentor you to do that. And one of the things that's happened is quite a few of the physiotherapists that have contacted me have said, okay, we're not specialists in that area, but we see a couple. But, you know, would you be able to direct me to a course or CPD um, or actually some mentorship, which is something I would love to develop in myself to be able to mentor more people to, to get more access yeah, for people. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and from what you're saying and from, from what I understand as well, it, the, the role 
for physiotherapists in in cancer and particularly around late effects and and management of that is is growing all the time isn't it and i think cancer is a massive public health issue it's a a massive source of um of, of disability and pain and uh, reduced quality of life and early death isn't it so i think it's an area that, that physiotherapists with our transferable skills as you mm. as you say can can really have a big input Brilliant. Um, so I, I wanted to chat to you about physical activity leadership, and um, is it, to my mind, you've demonstrated fantastic um, physical activity leadership in, in the development of the network and in promoting the role of, of physio in, in cancer prevention and cancer management. W- what does the term physical activity leadership mean to you? I, I think, with regards to anything that's got leadership in it, I'm I'm a big believer that actually you have to stick to your true values. So for me, one of my big values is patient care. And I think it's with most physiotherapists that you will talk to, that is, is patient care. Um, and if you stick to those values, if you if you role model what you what you are, you know, trying to lead, um, and you keep a passion alive, and, you know, and I'm very, very passionate in myself about physical activity and about keeping active, about inspiring women particularly to be active, um, then that passion actually then inspires others and motivates others. But I think it's also about not judging and not you know understanding where your beliefs are around physical activity whether you be someone that role models it or not um, but not judging others for the way that they do things not judging you know I, I see a lot of people both patients and physiotherapists who have a lot of barriers you know patients have barriers physical emotional barriers to why they can't be active and from a healthcare professional on a physio point of view there's also barriers around that confidence and that fear and I think it's it's being really non-judgmental and saying okay I'm quite open to, to whatever somebody comes at you with and, and developing it from there and mm-hmm. and so I think from from a leadership point of view um, and, and kind of I guess uh, hooking it onto the physical activity those kind of elements in themselves allow you to, to then develop you know, physical activity and others, mm. which is where I guess I see the leadership side of mm. things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's that's. Uh, it's really great to hear you say that because I think it's uh, we have to take a sensitive approach with patients, don't we? Because their um, their background and their beliefs and their values and everything about them will be very different to ours. And uh, it's it's really important that we don't impose our own views on patients, as you've said. Uh, and one of the ways that I think you've particularly developed, you, you've um, demonstrated physical activity leadership is you've moved on from the kind of one-to-one intervention into more of a kind of system-wide approach. And for me, that's a really big uh, opportunity for physiotherapists. I think we uh, we understand where our opportunities lie in terms of one to one interventions, but then taking a step further so that we start yeah. to think about how we can work with communities, how we can run campaigns, how we can work with schools and uh, uh, local government and, and that kind of thing at a, at a larger scale. I think there are a lot more opportunities there that, uh, that I really hope that we can move into in the future. Definitely. I, I think it's also, you know, one of the things I learned hugely when I set up the exercise class was I went into it with a very physiotherapy minded, you know, this is an exercise circuit. And, and one of the things I've learned hugely is, is about actually they help themselves in so many ways. And actually you can really empower people just by having that social network to do that. And as you say, then branch out into actually we don't want to do that in a hospital. We want to do it in a gym or we want to do it out in the park. You know, those kind of things, which yeah. is, is fab. So, yeah. you know, yeah. the patients themselves, um, a, a lot of what I've developed has always come from, from patients mm-hmm. and, and what they feed to me they want. Um, and, and I learn from that and, and I talk to other patients and then that helps to develop other things, mm-hmm. which is good. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, super. Um, so this is my last question for you, really. I wondered if you had any tips or any advice for physiotherapists who are sitting on a bit of an idea, they've got a project in mind or an idea for some kind of innovation. Uh, what, what would you say to those people? Um, I think I think with regards to it, I would just do it. You know, that's one of the things. I think a lot of people have hesitations and they say, well, what if this, what if that? I think you've just got to do it. I think you've got to keep your passion alive. Um, and even when you have people that constantly say, no, that won't work or no, this isn't right or, you know, oh, no, I wouldn't do it like that. Actually, just keep stick true to, to what you believe. Um, I think the important thing is to discuss it with others, so not to reinvent the wheel, not to be afraid to say, well, actually, this has been done, but can I do it better? Um, or to say, okay, I've got an idea, but actually it's already been done and accept that and, and you know, talk to those people about their challenges and their barriers and what they've come across. But I think ultimately it's about listening to the patient mm-hmm. and actually saying, what do they want? And, and does this fit? This might be an idea that I have, but does this fit with what? patients want because actually often it doesn't match up and you think oh this would be a great idea 
here, but then they say, oh, that's not going to work. Yeah. Um, and I think accepting that yeah. and saying, okay, I had a great idea, but perhaps it's not right. But yeah, I think the main thing is just take a risk and do it. Mm. That's the brilliant. biggest thing. Brilliant. So patience as partners, be tenacious, and then just get on and do it. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> and don't be put off by those people who say, oh, it'll never work, because I've had that all my life. <laughs> yeah, oh, those, are, those are brilliant top tips from Claire Lakes. Thank you very much, Claire, for sparing your time to chat to us tonight. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much.